Music Industry Sessions. This is Nick Gordon. I'm Chief Client Officer of Symphonic and have the great pleasure of being moderator of this panel of esteemed guests. Um, we're going to have everybody introduce themselves, but uh, I'll first start with a bit of a introduction to what this panel is. Um, so we're at an unprecedented time in, in music distribution. Um, you know, at no time since the advent of recorded music, really in the beginning stages of the 20th century, have there been so many consumer musical formats that have all been active at the same time. So people are still buying CDs, they're buying cassettes, they're buying vinyl, they're downloading music, they're streaming music from streaming sites like Spotify and Apple, they're listening to internet radio on Pandora, they're also interacting with music on Instagram stories and TikTok and, and there's just so many ways in which music is being um, sold directly to consumers legally. And, um, and it seems like each year uh, there's a new model that pops up. I don't think anybody saw TikTok a year and a half ago doing quite what it is now. And while it's still not monetized, it's certainly creating a lot of exciting uh, levers for music to uh, sell at the other sites. Um, we all saw what you know, that Fleetwood Mac video did that sh took a track that had been out, you know, since the 70s and skyrocketed it to back into the billboard charts just based on a dude riding a skateboard, um, riding down the street, um, <laughs> singing some Stevie Nicks. Um, or is that Christine McVie? And, and Stevie Nicks, we'll go Stevie Nicks. Um, so, uh, so this panel is to, to discuss how that music gets where it's going, and that's through music distribution. And um, this panel is, is made up of artists and managers and label owners um, who not only do what they do musically, but also have other, lots of other side jobs in the music business and various experiences that we thought would make them all great panelists. And the goal for, for everyone listening is to demystify the different types of distributors that are out, there are out there and help you make a decision as to when it's time to move from one segment of distributor to another. Um, so the segments of distributors that we're going to talk about are broken out by in three buckets. There are the self-service distributors. Those are ones like TuneCore and DistroKid and Label Engine. There's the major label owned distributors, and those are ones like InGrooves and ADA and The Orchard. And independent distributors, and those are ones like Symphonic and Secretly Canadian and Empire and Ditto. And one thing I wanted to say, um, that while Symphonic is the one who is, the company is hosting this panel, um, frankly speaking, every distributor that we're gonna talk about today is all a quality company run by quality and experienced people. And um, this is a very good time for artists and labels. You have a lot of choices um, and you have choices of a lot of really great companies run by great music people. Um, so th that's a wonderful thing to say and that is not um, historically accurate as far as talking about music distributors in the history of the business. Very traditionally, um, you know, in the business decades ago, um, talking about 20 distributors and recommending them all, even having one distributor talking very nicely about the competitors was, was unlikely. So this is a great time in the music business. People have great options. Artists and labels know they're going to get paid, they're going to get treated fairly, and it's really just about choosing which distributor option or bucket is right for them. Um, so we're going to try to not specifically talk about companies, but rather about buckets of distributors, whether they be self-service, um, major label owned, or independent distributors, just as, as option buckets for you. Anyway, so let's go around the um, the table, as it were, and uh, introduce ourselves. Once again, I'm Nick Gordon from Symphonic, and uh, let's start with Jesse. Hi, uh, my name is Jesse Breda. I live in Austin, Texas. I run a record label called Gravitas Recordings, primarily sort of focused on uh, what we call, uh, you know, world-based music, psychedelic based music, Burning Man inspired music. I also manage some artists. I have managed previously Clozy and a band called Beats Antique. I currently manage a group called Desert Dwellers. So I've been kind of on all sides. And I also run a web design agency called Lion Share Digital. And I have been a client of Symphonic since 2011. We're coming up on our 10th year as the label. We've had over 150 releases, albums, EPs, and compilations. and uh, Symphonic's been great for us, and I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. 
Awesome. And to you, Limbo. Hi, I'm Limbo. Um, I'm a singer, songwriter, producer, sound engineer, uh, chick, cat girl who lives in LA. And um, I've been doing this for probably about seven years now. And uh, I just, I was working as um, just completely independent, self-service distributor, everything. And then just this year, I signed with Symphonic and um, we've just been working as a team to put out new stuff and talk about the future of my brand and um, my project as a whole. And it's been really incredible to work with a team finally, rather than just go through my own brain about what I should do with my music and what the next plan is. So um, I'm really excited for what's to come with Symphonic and I'm honored to be here, of course. Awesome. And uh, let's move over to Anna. Hi, my name is Anna Yvette. I'm a producer, singer, songwriter um, from New York. And yeah, I've, I've like produced for, from anyone from like Machine Gun Kelly to Cheryl Cole. Um, I really work in a lot, mainly like EDM. Um, so I've worked with tons of labels, Monster Cat, Armada, NCS, um, you name it. And I, started to venture out into the independent world for my own music and that's how I discovered Symphonic. I started a collective, an artist collective that would not only help each other promote our music but also help each other with resources as far as like legal stuff, um, playlisting and in our journey to try and find what was the best move for our community we discovered Symphonic and we struck up a really great relationship so now not only do I work with Symphonic, but a lot of people in my collective choose to release with Symphonic just because of all the wonderful things and wonderful people that work there. So I'm very grateful to be on this panel today, um, speaking about all the different ways that you can release music independently with a label. And yeah, happy to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And moving on over to Ace. What's good? What's good, everybody? Uh, call me Ace. Uh, independent hip hop artist currently in Oakland. Um, been doing this. I mean, I've been rapping since a, a young one, um, but uh, only four years ago was I. Um, uh, I decided to just do this 100% um, independently, um, while juggling a full time job, which is also fun. Um, but yeah, so just as far as like how I even had experience with the distributor, you know, it was just like, okay, well, I need to get my music out there. <laughs> and how does one do that? So it was a lot of Google search, you know, there was some information about like, oh, you should use, you know, this kind of self-service model because they're, you know, that's like the route that a lot of indie hip hop artists used. And so, you know, I have experience with self-service, but then over time when I started to realize, okay, these are the kind of um, factors that would actually uh, make me want to work with the distributor. These are the different financial models that are out there. It's not just a one size fits all. It really had me start testing um, different waters. And so um, now I'm primarily, um, you know, in, in the independent distributor route and um, can talk about both of those sides for sure. Nice. Thank you. And now uh, over to Kevin. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Super honored to be here. Nice to meet all of you. I've been uh, p playing music professionally for probably about 10 years, kind of started in San Diego, was kind of played my first gigs there. I grew up in Hawaii and music is always a big part of the culture in Hawaii. So ukulele was my first instrument and I went to guitar and I started playing bass in a reggae band and eventually uh, linked up with Stick Figure, who I'm currently playing with right now. And we started our first tour in 2012 and have uh, been touring nationally since 2012 and then internationally about three years ago. And a couple years ago, I launched uh, K-Bong, which is kind of my solo project. So I'm sim simultaneously doing both. And uh, it's super exciting. I, I love being able to be an independent artist and learning more and more about kind of the business side of things, the distribution side of things, marketing things, as well as being creative on this side and writing the music and continuing to learn how to become a better performer, a better songwriter, and stuff like that. It's just exciting to be able to have that opportunity to learn all of that and just push my brand forward. So I'm excited to be here. It's nice to meet all of you. 
Awesome. We've got a really great and, and varied group of people here today, and that's really exciting. Um, so I'm going to assume that a lot of our audience are artists that are in varying stages of their career, uh, many of which are, are just starting out and are looking for information as to how to even choose where to begin with distribution. Um, so I'd love for everybody to just go around the room and um, talk about how you decided on the, the first distribution company you use or first distribution method and how you came to that conclusion. Um, and then maybe talk about just a couple things that you learned from that, whether you were, you made the right decision or you wish you had known X or Y and kind of what led you to, um, you know, where you're at today. Um, and let's start in reverse order. We'll start with you, Kevin. That's a, that's a great question. I want to say it's kind of the same with Ace. Like I might have just Google Google searched it at that time. Maybe I had a recommendation from a friend. So the first digital distributor that I ever went with was TuneCore, and I, I, I yeah, like I said, it might have been a Google search or something like that. Um, but I kind of had gone into it. They had sort of like I think it was like one price you pay, and then they'll take care of you from there and whatever, whatever. And uh, as I started utilizing the platform I was like okay this is okay but as I started getting more music and stuff I realized it was very hard to get through to like a real like kind of customer service side of things and um yeah so that, that was my first experience but I don't know if I want to continue talking more about that or but yeah no I'll definitely jump on what you said I mean the, the first my first goal was just yo I I got an album that I think I got a couple people that want to stream it how do I get it onto these streaming platforms? Figured out a little company that could get it on these streaming platforms. And at that time, that was the goal. Uh, and it, it, you know, once I was like, okay, well, well then what, what happens next? You know, I'm, I'm, you know, indie everything doing, you know, wearing all the hats, doing the marketing, doing this and that. Um, and then realizing like, okay, wait, there's, there's more than one. <laughs> there's more than one distributor out there. Um, they, they offer different things. And um, dang, there's a lot of other artists that are doing the same exact thing that I'm doing. So what really would even constitute any kind of like relationship outside of like a customer bot? But then when I started realizing that like other distributors do offer that kind of thing, I was like, oh wait, so then this company doesn't offer it at all. <laughs> you know, and then I was like, oh snap, like maybe I should like do a bit more research, right? So you know, to Kevin's point, I was like, okay, I got the first goal, you know, and I answered that first question, but then more questions started coming up that needed answers. And um, yeah, some of these uh, customer support uh, emails don't answer those questions as fast as others. So. <laughs> awesome. And uh, let's move on over to you, Anna. Same, same question. So, um, you know, I've really had a unique experience because I originally, when I started making music, I was in bands. So I was in punk bands and we would you know, just kind of use like CD baby, but it was more about the shows. So we didn't really care so much about streaming. And then as I moved on to becoming a producer, I got thrown into like the major label world, which they own your master. You get, you know, you get paid out, you get an advance and you just like, are like, I hope I get some publishing money. You know, like it's not, you know, and you're just kind of going like track by track. And then as I graduated into the EDM world and Spotify became more popular, um, it became, you know, I love working with labels that A, pay me monthly because now it helps me as an artist, as an independent artist, pay my bills. I have a monthly check coming in, which was incredible. And then I was like, great, well, I'm only giving up 50% of my master. So I'm getting paid on the master side. And I'm also getting to keep my publishing, which was wonderful. And somebody else is doing my monthly accounting. But at the same time, I was like, um, all right, well, I have songs that maybe don't fit with a label. What do I do? So of course, like everyone else, I Googled, where can I release my music? And I just kind of felt like CD Baby maybe wasn't like the right option because now I'm in a different realm. Um, and I started releasing with TuneCore and like everyone figures out there, you know, it's a big company and a lot of people are releasing. And when you have an issue, you know, yeah, they do respond, but perhaps not always in a timely fashion, especially when things are tagged incorrectly or and you, it needs to be fixed like immediately. Because as we all know, with Spotify and playlisting and Apple Music, if something's not tagged correctly on release day, you lose all of that momentum. So um, yeah, like uh, a couple of my friends, when they were self-releasing, they had suggested like, oh, you should really look into other distributors that they take a percentage 
and they offer you these services. And I was like, wait, 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 they, they offer you like services. Like, what do you mean? And a lot of distributors now will offer playlisting marketing. They'll say, Hey, your artwork needs to be this size for this. You know, do you know what I mean? Like they'll go over all of these things that as an artist, we don't really know, you know, like we have our music, we have like our, our art and our vibe and just, and then they kind of, add this extra layer of help. So I feel like, um, you know, as I started self-releasing more and, and learning more about how to successfully self-release, that's when I got guided towards symphonic just because of all of the things that I knew I needed as an independent artist, but didn't realize were available to me. Um, because there, you know, I only knew about TuneCore or DistroKid or something that's just sort of like upload your stuff and see how it does. You know, so yeah, so that's why I'm really grateful that uh, actually a friend recommended me. So yeah. Cool. So you, you brought up a good point. And before we move on to Limbo, um, I just wanted to sort of stop and clarify, because this is one of the things that artists and, and younger labels or managers don't quite understand is the difference between a distributor who charges a fee per release for your upload and ones that keep a percentage. Um, right. And it can be confusing. And, and because it's it's financial related. People often like kind of get frazzled by making that decision. And just to clarify, so, so the self-service distributors traditionally charge a fee either per year or per release, and you're paying just a flat fee for, for, for the, the job of moving your music from you to the streaming platforms and providing basic customer support. And the, the percentage-based distributors keep a per, they don't charge any fees and they keep a percentage of what you actually make from streaming. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's very different models and, and neither are right or wrong, just to be clear. Um, and, and despite us mentioning some of the distributors in the past, these, these are all, um, the, the companies are doing basically almost exactly what they say they're going to do. It's just a, a case often of people not, having the time or even knowing what the, the questions are in order to get answers to before making that decision. But basically, as a artist, you're very generically speaking, you're going to get people who are working on uh, based on a percentage of the revenue you make are incentivized to work a little harder um, to get you results because they only make money if you make money. Um, so Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, you're going to get more customer service time and a little bit more of a vested interest in helping you from the percentage-based distributors versus the fee-based distributors who, you know, for the ones who charge whatever $30 per release, that's all the money they're ever going to make from you, you know? So if you think about anything in life, what you can expect to make from a company or what you can expect to get from a company is going to make 20 bucks off you, you can imagine that there's a limit to how much they're incentivized to help you. So that's just the difference between those, those two different models. Um, whereas, and I'll say something, you know, positive about the, the, the self-service distributors. If you're a company that doesn't need a whole lot of help, if you have a full staff, if you've got people pitching your stuff for playlists, if you've got a great operational person in house who knows all the logistics of dealing with everything related to um, streaming data and all that stuff, sometimes you don't need more than that, but um, most people don't have that stuff in house. Anyways, I digress, but um, let's go back to Limbo with the same question. Um, yeah, I'll touch back on the, the percentage and, and all that in a second, but in my experience, before I started this project, um, I worked with a couple people who knew what they were doing more than I did. I was just a teenager. I didn't know what I was doing. I just wanted to make music. And so um, we used, I think, I forget the name of it. I think it was CD Baby, though. But we you know, paid a certain amount to release the album, and, and, and that was it. And I remember not knowing where to find my music, not knowing where to find the stats. You know, I, was, I wasn't told. And... I don't think it was it was easy, but um, with this project, I knew I didn't want to go that route, and so I just kind of asked asked my friends and and uh, tried to figure out what they were doing with their music, and um, and then I found DistroKid and and I uh, was with them for a little bit, and while I was distributing through them, just by myself, just steadily putting out songs and albums. Um, one of my songs caught a lot of traction on TikTok, and then. Um, 
And then of course my distribution company was really happy with that. And so they made me a priority artist. And so I was able to upload faster and get better support and stuff like that. And it was incredible, but um, I still wasn't getting enough support from like a, a team sense. And so um, I had been looking for a different distributor for a while, probably a few, few months, maybe a year. And um, Symphonic reached out and um, I'm very grateful because it was in the perfect timing where I needed that extra oomph because sometimes after so many years of doing something, it can kind of get draining and you need a new spark to, to kind of get you going. And um, yeah, so I, I got to meet everybody on the team and everyone's so great and always willing to help. And um, like I said before, like it's just been really great to, to have a team behind me to talk about my future of my music rather than just um, kind of wonder myself what's going to happen next. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess that's all I got to say. <laughs> I think also the percentage routes for a distributor is, is like you're saying, Nick, a little bit um, better because, well, in my eyes, it's a little bit better because um, it's, there's that incentive to, to kind of work harder and, and then everybody gets to reap the benefits. So, yeah. Awesome. And over to you, Jesse. Yeah, so when we first started, I think our first two releases were with CD Baby, but then we quickly switched to Symphonic. And the reason for that, because we were electronic music focused, we wanted to be up with, with Beatport, and that was a big deal with us. We wanted to chart on Beatport, we wanted to be you know, discoverable there. And so that made a big deal. And at the time, I don't think Symphonic offered or was even doing, well, maybe they were doing percentage deals, but we were going with the sort of pay per upload model. So it did kind of match the, you know, the, the independent route there. Um, but yeah, I think I echo everyone like customer service was a big deal. Having someone that I could ask questions to and like know how to understand how to navigate things was, was a huge deal for us. Cool. Um, so now I wanted to ask a couple follow-up questions and, and put some of you on the spot, uh, uh, which will come to no surprise to anyone. Um, most of us in the music industry have many a side hustle. Um, and some of those side hustles are within music. Sometimes you're an artist and you also write songs for other people. Sometimes you're an artist and you actually work in the music industry, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, so sort of a two-part question. Um, and I'm going to go, go back to you because you, you mentioned having, um, having been on a major label uh, before and also being in bands. Um, what, 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 what's your perspective after having experience with both self-releasing, being on a label, um, and how, how has that informed sort of how you think about the different options out there with respect to how to get your music out? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I, I feel very fortunate that I've actually been able to experience like the whole spectrum of like indie labels, major labels. Um, you know, when you're working with a major label, you really don't get, um, you don't get the, the quality. That's, I don't want to say quality. You don't get to participate as much in the decisions because you're working with people who are experts in their field where they're like this is how we're going to market it this is our budget this is what we're going to do this worked 10 hundred times before so we're just going to follow this formula and it's not exactly as tailored i think as you would think it would be and it's also the excitement of i'm working with major label oh my god like my dream right that's every musician's dream so um I think when I first started, because that was my first experience, I just kind of thought, oh, this is normal. And then when I started working with indie labels and things were more about, um, you know, what who what what it was going to be as a project or, oh, here are the cool, like, kind of other things that we can do outside of just like the tried and true, like, you know, radio ads or this type of marketing. Um, you know, and things kind of shifted more towards video games, like kind of a counterculture approach. Um, that's when I really got to see how effective, like thinking outside the box is, you know, and just like opened up my eyes to like a broader spectrum. So like when I finally started like self-releasing, um, I could see the value of all the, all the different marketing techniques that would translate into making me money, right? For my release so i had a self-release shooting star 
and you know every label said no nobody wanted it all these major labels said no 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 and i was like fine i'm gonna self-release it and i got a sync with forza horizon 4 and the song just like blew up and i feel very fortunate because i kind of was schooled in this i knew i had a sync i knew i had a community i knew that people would come back and find the song because there would be all these playlists even though they weren't spotify official I knew that like gamers were going to use it and it was going to be huge in that community. So that really offered me an opportunity. And I think that's one of the greatest things about working with all these different types of labels is you can figure out, like, you can literally see like, this works, this doesn't work. You know, we're like, I'm not putting my money into this or I'm putting my money into that. And as far as like distribution goes, I think that's also one of the reasons why I think Symphonic is so unique because you guys have a sync department and you offer that to your clients. And that's huge, especially nowadays when you don't get, not everybody's always going to get that playlist ad. And even if you get in a playlist, what's the retention rate of that? Are you going to actually get fans? Are people going to follow you? Or are they going to follow your brand? You know, that's kind of all, you know, Spotify holds those numbers. Like you could have 20,000 followers on Spotify, but you don't get those email addresses, right? So, so is it true, um, touching on what you said that, you know, ap after having been on a major, seeing how they promote records, how they respond to successes and leverage one success into other successes that because you had seen that, that you understood a bit more of how to do that on your own? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. But also I saw how, um, I don't know how to say this without getting into trouble, but I'm just going to say it. Um, a lot of the successful artists that are on major labels are successful, not because of the label, they're successful because of their team and the things that they the do out there you know what i mean like the marketing people that they'll hire right. um you know look at iggy azalea i think she's a perfect case of like her one song blew up and she was on a major and then they were really like holding her back and she was like you know what i'm just gonna do my own thing and release like self-release and she you know has her own fan base that she like you know brought it back to herself her own fan base they all have a home and she's a successful independent artist you know, a lot of people do that. And I think sometimes, um, even though you see what's successful, you can kind of also see like, that doesn't work, you know, or like that's limiting for me as an artist, or I don't want to have to answer to a label that says, that's not a good idea. We don't like that. Or, oh, we don't have the budget for that. You know, and even people working within a major label themselves have to fight against what goes on in a major label. Like, so for example, you know, um, can I tell stories from other people? I don't, will I get in trouble? <laughs> Yeah, you won't get in trouble with me. All right. Well, for example, like, you know, I took a pill in Ibiza, Mike Posner's record. Um, they weren't really doing anything with it. And, you know, they really just believed in that song. They had it remixed. And literally one of the guys in charge of that record being so successful went out to every single club and was like, you guys have to play this song. You have to play this song and built it from the ground up. The label didn't believe in him. And then it became a number one hit. So it really depends Like you could get so lucky and have somebody like that on your team that from the label that's like, I believe in this, I'm going to ride super hard for you. But if you don't have somebody like that at a label, it's a little scary. You're kind of left out in the dark. So um, I think as an, every artist wants to be able to have that control and have a team and have people who are excited about their records and have people who are going to be creative and be like, Oh, like, what about this? What about this marketing idea? Or, you know, and it's a gamble because when you're, you know, the, the contracts in a major label are pretty uh, scary sometimes. Right. So you said something that was, that was genius, and I want to turn it over to other people on the panel for their perspective. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, when what everyone's shooting for is, is success, right? And sometimes it happens whether or not we want to admit it. Sometimes it happens by accident, um, which is fine. And sometimes it happens based on planning. And it really doesn't matter which, which whether you planned it or if it was luck. What only matters is what you do with that success, how you leverage it into more success. Um, so I wanted to start with Limbo, um, who had a, a, a massive breakout hit early on in her uh, trajectory of releasing music. And I want to go to everybody and just talk about when you've had success with something organically, whether you, you tried to make it happen or it happened totally by accident, um, how does, what is having a certain type of distributor or the distributor you had at the time, what, what tools have you had available um, to leverage to make that success turn into more successes? 
Um, so when my song first started to take off, I, I was just, I remember constantly checking the stats all the time just to make sure that it was real <laughs> and tangible, you know, like I didn't know how much money I was going to make off of, off of these streams that were happening. And, um, I didn't really know how to monetize YouTube videos that were using the song and it was all very confusing to me at first. Um, but I definitely just utilized the statistics of it all a lot and, and always checked, um, like weekly, you know, I, I had to like wean myself off of doing that because it can be a problem sometimes. <laughs> I'm sure everybody here knows that. Um, but you know, it's, it's good to check in on, on your, your future and if you'll be secure and safe. But, um, yeah, I remember in the start, I just, I, it, it was, I wouldn't say it's accidental, but it definitely, um, it just happened out of nowhere. So I guess, I guess you could say it's accidental. Um, but, but, you know, I had been working on the project for, for, you know, four or five years and, and putting out music constantly. And, um, I had attracted an audience before the song blew up and I was happy with what I had just, just by that too, you know, just making enough to pay rent was, was totally cool by me. And then, um, and then the song blew up and I was like, okay, this is when, this is when I need some help. <laughs> but I still went on years just, just trying to figure out myself and going to visit these major labels and um, going through the process of kind of deducting what I wanted for my future and, and listening to friends' experiences with their major labels and um, just choosing the independent route in the end. And I'm really happy I did. I'm so glad I did because as we all know, it can be a very snaky industry and um i'm just happy to work with people that i that i actually genuinely trust and and want to work with nice let's go to ace now um ace talk about su some successes you've had and um and the tools that you had at your disposal to leverage that success based on the partners you had at the time definitely um so uh a couple of successes would be like um my debut album hitting the iTunes chart and Billboard's chart, um, being able to um, sell a certain amount of albums so that I could raise money, a um, few thousand dollars to um, combat racial injustice um, in this country. Um, you what know, the tools they streams use? and streams. Huh? How, how did, what were the tools you used to, to help um, get your, your independent record up, up the charts. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, really some of the tools were like the, the instant gratification, uh, option, um, being able to, um, do playlisting. So putting the album into the queue at an early enough time where I can, you know, start doing a lot of, uh, heavy pitching, um, pre-save. Um, I really wish there was like a, <laughs> like a pre-order, like a pre-order function. But I think Apple, like iTunes is basically like a defunct thing. Um, but, you know, at the time that would have been a dope thing to have. So I had to like do some kind of work around in order to make that happen. Um, so that was the, that was like kind of like the behind the scenes, the before. Um, and then, you know, after, um, you know, a couple things that really stood out, I think, um, Limbo mentioned this earlier, but just like the sync licensing opportunities, um, just being able to, um, you know, then take a song and be like, hey, like, can we like pitch this places, right? Or like the a and Ring aspect of, you know, getting songs added. Like I think um, uh, on my last project uh, and even the last single that I just dropped, I believe that they've all been on some kind of symphonic playlist, you know? Um, and so just like continuing with that exposure and, and, and um, increasing the, you know, the viability of the song uh, have definitely helped for sure. Nice. And to you, Jesse, um, being someone who wears a few different hats, um, when you've got something that's starting to take off, whether it's an artist you work with or a, a release on your label, when something starts to catch fire, um, how do you use your distributor to throw flames on that fire and turn it into something bigger? I mean, obviously communication is a, a huge deal. I mean, first and foremost, looking at your stats, 
but more than that, understanding the relationship between those stats, for instance, like in Spotify, understanding your play counts to your listeners, to your saves and like, what's that, what's really happening there and kind of understanding the model of the algorithm and, and what to look for and seeing like, okay, this is having some organic traction. Let's communicate this back to the team internally. And then also to your distributor and saying, Hey, this is what's happening. And then coming up with a strategy. I mean, every, everything is different depending on the platform, depending on where, where it's happening. And that's where having, someone that lives in the, in the distribution world and understands, you know, the label world, the art, the independent artist world up to the distribution or the DSPs. And they're in between that and they understand what the goals of all of these people are trying to do. They can communicate that effectively. And they're really a bridge because in, as an independent artist, you don't really understand what the DSPs or a label, you don't understand what the DSPs are dealing with and how much is coming at them and, and distributors do. And that there's sort of there by, 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 you know, by default, by need, because they're there to filter and kind of translate what's happening and make it make sense. And some, sometimes an independent artist or label won't know how to communicate to a DSP in a way that makes sense for them. So, uh, yeah, just looking at your stats and then communicating with your team, what's happening, where it's happening and trying to take, take advantage of it when it's, when it is on our side, one of the things that we like to do when we are seeing something happen is obviously just pouring fuel on the fire. If you've got a song or an album that's, that's having success, putting more ad spend on that specific song, reworking the creative, coming back and, and trying to maybe do, you know, more follow up on press or a more, a deeper dive into the song. One of the things that we've had good success with is, is sort of addressing to the production community, giving away stems or samples or talking about the making of the track. There are so many artists that want to make music and they're they're if they're your fan base. And so letting them see how you did it. And then you start to have that mind share that can really, you know, plant the seed with them and they'll go back and listen to it again and again because of that. Got it. And Kevin, you dropped off for a little bit there. Um, the question is, is um, when you've experienced success as an artist, um, whether, whether it's an accident or something you planned, um, how did you use a lot, utilize your distributor or your team or the technology you had from your distributor to make that success into a bigger success? That's a good question. That's a really good question. Thank you. For me, I think, I think my, so sort of my independent music career kind of as a solo artist is just getting started. And that's where I'm kind of focusing on as I'm playing in this in bigger collective with the reggae band stick figure, we've got our team working in there doing, um, you know, a really good job kind of steering the ship. Now, when it comes to like my solo career as K Bong, like I'm definitely diving in and still getting used to a lot of these kind of terms and a lot of the different things. Um, as far as something that really caught fire, um, I, I, yeah, I'm still getting, I don't know. I don't even know if I've really been there yet, but uh, I, working with Symphonic and even just the emails, like throwing an email and you guys get back to me right away has been really crucial. And um, I, I think a lot of it for me is just like hitting it, hitting it hard on like the social medias and, and kind of engaging my fan base that way. And I'm actually excited for like an upcoming album I'm, I'm working on and I'm excited to dive in further and like try to, like you said, Jesse, put fuel on the fire and like get it going. You know, and I'm just really, really excited to be working uh, with Symphonic right now on stuff like that. And uh, yeah. Cool. So I wanted to ask everyone the question, um, you know, it, it's always discussed within the independent community is the difference between being independent and being on a major label. And I think everyone always wonders, uh, you know, is the grass greener on, on either side? And I wanted to ask all of you, um, what you believe the, um, you know, what your impressions are or what your experience have been um, or what your goals are with respect to remaining independent versus working with a major label and, um, and why you might think those are, are good or bad attributes of, of goals. And let's start with, uh, let's start with Anna. Anna, um, you went sideways again, Anna. I'm sideways again? <laughs> yeah. Hang on. Let me see if I can fix it. Hold up. How's that? Is that better? Yep. Good. Okay. Um, what was the question again? I'm sorry. So um, what, 
Uh, what's your viewpoint of being independent versus uh, working? Can you hear with me? Yep, we can hear you. Oops, looks like we have some technical. Wait, can you guys hear me? We can hear you, yeah. Can you hear us? Let's start with, uh, let's go while we're figuring that out. Let's go to Ace. Ace, what are your impressions of working with a major versus staying independent? I can hear you guys. Your career trajectory. Oh, wait, there you are. Go for it, Ace. Yeah, okay. Um, so my impressions, well, I mean, I've never been on a major label, so I can't speak for what it actually is. Um, you know, I guess though, like, I mean, we grow up, we see the major labels, you know, so we, there's a, there's a sense of recognition, there's a sense of brand identity and affiliation with the label, right? Uh, you hear a name like Def Jam, you hear a name like, you know, Rock Nation, you hear these names are shady um, and they mean something, you know, I'm speaking in, in, in the hip hop industry, you know? And so um, there's definitely, you know, an emotional connotation when you hear a major label's name and, you know, usually folks desire for that attribution to be on their brand name as well. And the hope and the desire is that like, you know, that plus that equals like pff, major, you know? Um, but, you know, the more that I hear uh, stories and the more that I do the work myself, the more I realize that, um, you know, I was just listening to 50 Cent's book, um, Hustle Harder, Hustle Smarter, and he was talking about being signed uh, to Columbia and how he learned that, yo, I have to do the work anyway, <laughs> you know? And so he saw it as like an internship opportunity to, go into all of these different rooms and learn how to do PR, learn how to do marketing, learn how to do operations and finances, et cetera, so that he could attribute it to himself and basically blow himself up, like, like Anna said. And so, um, you know, the more that I think about it, it's like, as far as the, the differences are concerned, as an artist or as an act, as a band, I mean, you still have to do the work. Um, and so if I still have to do the work, <laughs> um, then what am I really placing my value on? Uh, and that's a question that I ask in, in various forms, right? Like, I don't, I don't believe that I need other companies, like brands to define who I am. And so it really comes down to what is it that I'm actually seeking to achieve? And is the company, whoever I'm working with, willing to um, do that with me in a favorable way, something that I feel is favorable? Uh, something that I value, right? Like for me, I value autonomy. I value the ability to be creative. Uh, I value <laughs> like fairness and equity, like especially if, if I'm going to be doing a lot of this stuff, <laughs> you know? And so, um, you know, those are the kind of uh, like factors that I take into consideration. Um, and at this moment in time, you know, being independent and working with, um, you know, independent distributors makes the most sense for my business because, um, you know, it provides me with that flexibility. It provides me with folks that are able to, you know, uh, for a percentage able to, you know, help me in areas where I don't have those capabilities, but simultaneously a lot of the stuff is still in house and I'm able to move in the way that I feel comfortable moving and, um, grow and hit the milestones and successes that I'm meant to have, you know, and, um, just watch everything be the way it's supposed to be. And I'm not tripping about it. Amazing. Uh, let's go to Jesse. Same question. You're a manager, you're a label owner. Um, being a manager often means advocating for the absolute best route for that particular artist. Um, and wearing another hat of also having a label, you know, um, the benefits of an artist being on a label or your label. Um, when's the time for an artist? How do you, how do you view the option of working with a major label? Um, and, uh, you know, what's your viewpoint on that, uh, on a case by case basis? Yeah. I mean, it's a sticky question. Uh, it comes down to like what your, what your immediate goals are, right? There can be a huge bump. Like Ace said, if you're, if you get a chance to be signed to Def Jam, like that's going to blow your name up. You're going to get, you're going to get seen and get, you know, put in places that you could never touch most likely as an independent. And so that, that can fast track you. But the downside of that obviously is the ownership of your masters and the long-term 
financial gains or losses of signing, you know, your intellectual property to someone else. So it's really a look at, you know, do we believe we can do this on our own or does this, is the, is the deal presented going to really get you where you want to go? You know, what we're seeing in today's landscape is it's, you know, it's difficult to make a living just by releasing music. More and more people are doing it and things are, are getting better, but m most of the money is always made live, right? So if you can blow up and you can get a lot of people listening to your music and then you can go play shows, that's your opportunity to kind of cash in on that, uh, you know, on, on your name and what you've been able to build up on the buzz. So we always look at it at a case by case basis. I will kind of say for a band that I was managing, you know, they did a deal with a larger distributor, not a label, but they took some advances. And so it was kind of like a, a label deal. And, you know, at the end of the day, they were paying something close to 30% um, out to that distributor still 10 years later. And these albums had made, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it really cost them an insane amount of money on the long term. And, and, and you know, I don't know that they, they really, that distributor really helped them. So uh, possibly, but I'm, but I'm not sure. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you got to take a long, hard look at it. It just depends on the label depends on your project. It depends on if you're really aligned with them. And, and I think, you know, Ace said it well is like, are, are they going to really work the project? I mean, we've heard horror stories of being on a major label and things, things don't work on that first album and maybe they don't work on the second album or, or, or release. And then you get dropped or you're stuck in a deal that you can't get out of. I loved what Anna said about Iggy is like, that's, you know, that's, that's, starting to be the real look. I mean, there is a clear path for independence to have major success in the world, but it is, it does come down to having a team. So ultimately having a management team, marketing team, people like that really working with you, you know, you're going to pay percentages on that as well. So if you're giving away, you know, you know, if you're working with people and, and paying them a percentage on management and, and marketing, and then also with a distributor and also with a label, there may be nothing left for you at the end. So I really advise people to hold on to their masters and their publishing as much as possible. I mean, that's it's kind of as an artist, the only thing you have. So it really has to, to make sense. Nice. So as we're wrapping up, I wanted to go down the line once again and um, think about all the artists or labels or managers that are at the same place that you're at. Um, and if you could offer them one piece of advice as far as making a good decision about distribution based on what you've learned, what would it be? And then if you want to plug anything that you're working on or your social media or anything like that, so people can find you directly, feel free to do so. And um, let's start with Anna. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, wait, what was the beginning of the question again? I'm sorry, you asked like three things. For, for, uh, for artists or labels or people who are at the same place as you are, but might be wondering about how to make their next um, distribution move, what, what advice would you offer them and oh. feel free to plug yourself or your how, how people can contact you. I think the best thing you could do, especially if you're in a realm where you're looking to self-release, is really sit down and zoom out. Think long term. Think about what things are important to you. So, for example, if you're, if you're just putting out a song that maybe you put out a couple of years ago, but you never officially released it and you don't really want a big push behind it, maybe a, distribu a distributor that's just going to take a one-time fee, that works for you because you just want it aggregated on all the DSPs. And that's fine. But if you're really looking to push it, like it's your project, this is your baby, every, everything that's been echoed in this um, meeting today has basically been that you need a team. And I think that's something you really want to consider. And that's something that Symphonic definitely offers. You want a team of people who are going to take the time to familiarize themselves with your vision, how they can make it happen in the best possible way, how you're going to, you know, maybe your, your goal, like, you know, you really have to be specific with your goals. Maybe your goals are, I want to be on these playlists, or I want to play on this festival, or I want to be in this type of movie, or I want these types of fans, or I want to go viral on TikTok. Like, make sure you're writing down your specific goals so that you can actually reach them and find the team that's going to work the best for you. Um, I think that's one of the things that's always really helped me is being very specific with the outcomes that I've desired. And then how do you get there? Finding a team or finding, you know, funding or finding, you know, whatever, whatever's going to work the best for you. Um, 
Yeah. And I think that's also like just, just kind of being involved in a collective. One of the most important things for most of us, because mostly everyone in our collective, we don't rely on touring. We rely on streaming. Like that's the main source of my income is stream income, especially in today's day and age. So I think also another really important thing that you need to realize is how am I getting paid? How am I getting paid? Okay. Like, am I getting paid monthly? Can I pay my bills on this? Can I reinvest that into my brand, into my, you know, craft? Maybe I need new, like something new for my studio. So I think you always kind of have to really think about it from a business angle. And that's also another really important thing. Some distributors only pay you out quarterly. Is that okay for you? Maybe yes, maybe not. Some, I know a lot of people who have really been able to fast track their career because the distribution they work with pays them monthly. You can track your stats. You can see, oh, I'm doing, I'm performing really well with this demographic. That's also really important, being able to have access to your stats where you can break them down and continue to make it work for you. Like, oh, I'm going to market towards this. I'm going to market towards, you know what I'm saying? Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's definitely the best advice that I could give. And the other advice that I would give, um, not only while choosing a platform, but just in general is get your email list together. Always have an email list together of your fans so that you can always be in direct communication with them. I think that's something that, you know, like SoundCloud, you know, you can, you can message people back and forth, but it's a little bit, you know, we, we all know how the messaging on SoundCloud is. So <laughs> the most important thing you can do is invest in a service that will allow you to collect people's email addresses so you can constantly be in touch with your fans and promoting your projects to them. Um, so yeah, I mean, I have an album coming out top of 2021. It's like also gonna be coming out with a graphic novel that I wrote. Um, so yeah, just keep in touch with me. You can follow me on all social media. My name is Anna Yvette. And yeah, I mean, write me, write me any questions you have. I'm always down to help out, especially when you have questions about you know, what distributor would be the right fit for you. I mean, obviously I love Symphonic. You guys have been incredible to me. So that's my, that's my first pick, but um, yeah, it's been a pleasure speaking with all you guys today and, and hearing your stories and learning. It's been great. Thank you. So Thank much. you. And let's go to Kevin. Same question. Uh, offer advice to people at the same place that you're at and then tell us how people can find you on the internet. Awesome. For any upcoming artists that maybe tuned into this right now, like that's, that's huge. Like that's the first step. That's, it's, it's like as an independent artist, it's, we have such an incredible opportunity to have control of our careers. And I think maybe there was this idea back in the day where it's like, oh, once I get signed, it's over. I'm going to make it big. I'm done. But that's like kind of a thing of the past, you know? And there is a thing where like, if you get to a major label, yeah, Def Jam and it could fast track you. But I think the main route for artists that are hungry and making music, like do the research, like educate yourself as far as digital distributors, like look at what TuneCore offers, look at what Symphonic can do for you. Look at what DistroKit, try to, um, you know, make those, do the research and make those comparisons and, and really put in the work. Cause even when you do find the distrib uh, distributor you're going to go for, or, or management or whatever it is, like you still got to meet them head on and put in just as much work um, and meet, kind of meet them in the middle. It's not sign up and it's done and I'm going to make it big and it's over uh, for this. That's, I think that's my best advice for upcoming artists. Do the work, do your research, be hungry, stay focused and, and just be happy. We have an incredible opportunity to make the most and be independent and, and, and have the control. So it's really exciting time right now. Nice. And how do we find you on the internet, Kevin? I, at Kbong Music on Instagram. And I'm looking forward to connecting with everybody here today. And for anyone else that's tuned in, shoot me a line anytime um, at Kbong Music on Instagram as well as kbongmusic.com. And yeah, it's, the, it's a abbreviation of my full name, Kevin Bong, Kbong. Right on. Thank you so much, brother. And over to you, Ace. I bet so. Um, I mean, Anna, Kevin, they, they killed it because those are, those are honestly how I feel as well. You know, um, I would say the five things, uh, would be to keep studying, keep learning. Um, this industry changes all the time, you know, just earlier this week, we read about the, the new initiative, so to speak, that Spotify is now leveraging, um, to have people basically <laughs> promote their their tracks for you know slightly lower um uh royalties and 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 you know it's like how how can you leverage that 
right? In, in, your, in your new marketing strategy, if you choose to. Um, you know, I, when I started, you know, I was like, oh, like, let me get CDs from CD Baby and da 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 like, right as streaming was basically taking over. And like, even my own laptop doesn't have a, like a area where I could put in a CD to listen to it. So it's like, are, are you just like running with this like fantasy of what you think the music industry is? Or are you staying really tuned in to like how the music industry is evolving and it evolves every single day. So you have to keep studying, um, getting a team. I mean, I, I would put an asterisk on it and say, do as much as you can until you realize that you can't do anymore and that you need to specialize. Um, because, you know, before, you know, having someone to help me with the marketing, I was doing my own marketing. You know, I, I mean, I still do my own marketing, but now like I have someone to like help me with that, right? Like before getting a publicist, like I was reaching out to the folks and, you know, writing my own uh, things that were getting posted and things like that, right? And so, you know, you do, you know, booking your own show. I mean, back when shows were a thing, but like booking my own shows until I was able to get someone to help me, you know, do that, right? So, you know, you you just continue to learn as much as you can and, and do as much as you can until you really need someone to help you do the other stuff. And that, to um, Anna's earlier point, like as you're, you're researching all these different distributors, you won't know what you need until you like really need it. You know, there's a difference between like, oh, like I really wish I could have this and that da, 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 versus like, yo, I really just need my song on Spotify. <laughs> like once you, like once you understand what you really need, then it's very clear what you can go shoot for. Meeting people um, is, is my third thing. Just really understanding like there's, there's a whole world outside of you and, and wherever you make your music. And so, you know, I, I met Nick Gordon at a conference last year, right? And just to even be here full circle a year later, right? Like that's just, we just met, you know? And so like just continue to meet folks um, uh, and, and you have no idea you know, next week, next year, 10 years, right? I have a song coming, I have an album coming out uh, in top of 2021. And one of the songs is with someone from like three, four years ago. She's a dope singer, always knew she was a dope singer. It just so happens that now we're gonna do something together. And so just continue to meet people, expand your network, set very clear goals. You know, it's different to say, I wanna do something or I need to do something. Say that you commit to doing something and give it like a very specific, I commit to, making a song by the end of this month and I'm going to have it on all digital streaming platforms. Like when you say that it's no longer a wish it's, 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 it's accountability you know, to yourself and don't lie to yourself. <laughs> um, and you know, the last thing is just do the work, man. Like there's a difference between, you know, any, anyone can dream, but you, you got to do the work as well. Um, so just do the work. Um, clear goals, meet the people, get the team, but only when you actually need it, um and just keep learning uh you can find me i mean anywhere you know call me ace legit uh <laughs> uh or call me ace.com it's call me ace is three words it's like a tribe called quest it's really grammatically incorrect but it flows um and yeah you're a very accessible human being reach back out when you reach out to me and uh just equally a pleasure meeting all y'all on the panel and um definitely looking forward to staying in touch with you soon Thank you so much, Ace. That was wisdom. Um, over to you, Limbo. I don't really know how to follow that up, but uh, <laughs> it basically what everyone else has said already. Um, you know, doing the work is really important. Um, making sure you're real with yourself and and knowing that this this industry is um, it it can be a lot sometimes, and um, especially for a female in the industry, it's 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 tricky out here to trust people and and make sure that you're in good hands you know not being taken advantage of and um i think it's really important to to know that that getting that major label deal is not the end goal like i think kevin was talking about like it's it's changed like this is a new futuristic time we're living in where we can take it in our own hands and do it ourselves right on on the internet um and uh, i think what ace was saying is that you know do as much work as you possibly can yourself you know you, we have the internet we have the capability to learn all these things by ourselves independently and and build ourselves up and and you know kind of imagine what we want out of our own project in future and then 
when the time comes where where you're juggling too much yourself, then then is the time to kind of find someone to help. And um, in my case, I I had a manager for a really short time after the TikTok blow up, and um, it ended up not working out just because they didn't they didn't know me very well and and they didn't know how to represent me very well, and so it was kind of like a weird dynamic that I had to work through. And it was my first manager ever, and it's the first time I was ever working with someone for my music and. In the end, I just kind of realized that I needed to find a genuine team who who really gave a shit about <laughs> me and my project and vice versa. You know, I really wanted to work with someone who I believed in just as much as they believed in me. And so after so much research and, and doing that, then I found Symphonic and I'm very happy that I'm, I'm with y'all. But um, yeah, I think I think the best advice is is what everyone has already said. Just do the work and um, do as much as you can and, um, do a lot of research and, um, yeah, take, take advantage of the internet and, and all its powers. That's my advice. <laughs> Beautiful. And where do we find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me at, you know, limbo everywhere online. Awesome. Over to you, Jesse. Love it. Great advice, everybody. Uh, I want to echo some of those. You know, Ace was, and uh, Anna were saying smart goals. So giving it a time, a, a place, like a number. How are you going to, you know, when is that going to happen? What is it? What does it look like? Not just, you know, I want to release an album, but when and, and, and all of those specific details. One of the things I say is what everybody's saying is uh, do, do the work. I say treat it like a job. Show up. Put it on your calendar. Say, so, yeah, this is when I'm going to work on this track from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. You may have a day job. And just do the work, show up, treat it like a job. Uh, one of the things that Anna hit on that I really like is about data and the email list. Like sending people to Spotify or DSPs, it's, we're kind of giving our power away, guys. I recommend Bandcamp. I recommend email lists. Build your fans. And with that, when we're looking at stats or these numbers, understand that these are people, these are human beings, and our goal with music is to really connect with people. So it's fan by fan, song by song, day by day, you know, note by note, and really thinking about that. And when you're, when you're writing emails or when you're posting on social media, thinking about that one person that you're trying to connect with, just like when you're up on stage looking out there and trying to make that one person smile. And that's really what this is all about, is connecting with people. And this, the technology, the internet can kind of make it blurry and hard, but, but feeling that thinking about that when you show up is, is, is critical. And I say, believe in yourself. Like that's so crucial for an independent artist is like, nobody's going to do this for you. Nobody's going to open the door and let you in. I mean, this is a hard business, a hard game and you have to have it. You have to want it and you have to show up every day and you may get told no a thousand times. And, and this is a story that we've all heard, but just keep going and, and it's, it's worth it. It's important right now during COVID we're seeing what are we all turning to is music and the arts and trying to connect with each other and experience the beauty of life through music, through art, through, through our creativity. And so it's really important that we're doing this. And, and I think our society is kind of like not doing a great job of showing up for us, but we can come together as independent music artists and support each other. And so on that last point, as an independent artist, when you're getting started, it's, it sort of feels like, what if I reach out to this person who's at this place and ask them to help me out? I don't suggest doing that. What I do is reach out to somebody and offer to help them in a very specific way that you know you can help them. Don't say, how can I help you? Because what that does is they're like, okay, let me figure out a way that this person can maybe help. That's, that's more work for them. Figure out like, this is a thing I'm good at. This is how I could help them. Maybe that you're good at websites. Maybe you're good at mastering. Maybe you have, you know, some, something on your side hustle or your day job that you're really good at. Offer to help them with that. And that can open massive doors. Ace was also great too about saying like, connect with people, network, network, network. And, and, and again, lead with what you can do for people because that's, we're all self-interested. And when someone plays to your ego, it says like, how can I help you? That, that opens up the conversation where we're all on our defensive when people are asking for things from us. We only have limited time, money, and, and, uh, and bandwidth in our lives. So, man, thank you guys so much. It was great to meet you all. Go music. <laughs> and where, where do we find you on the internet, Jesse? Yeah, uh, you know, my label, Gravitas Recordings, just a Google of that, or my name, Jesse Breda, Instagram, Twitter, uh, either one of those work. Awesome. And uh, third time's the charm. I'm going to offer the same advice that, uh, that Jesse 
and really everyone touched on is um, this is a business of people who care about what we do. We care about music. We all have something in common. And at the end of the day, your career and your ability to make moves is based purely on your relationships. And um, do not be afraid to reach out to people at different levels than you, make friends with them, try to get together with them in person, get off Twitter, get off Instagram, make real relationships. Um, and if people don't, if you're working with people that don't wanna get together with you for a beer, or a cup of coffee, um, they're, not, they're not real friends, you know? And uh, people who like you will want to do that. And that's how you form relationships and it, and it transcends every deal you do, it transcends everything, and those are the people you will count on as your career goes by. Um, the other thing I want to recommend to everybody is learn the history of the music business. Um, this business is changing quickly, but it's cyclical and, um, and, and things that have happened in the past are bound to repeat themselves. And you can learn a lot about how other artists or managers or labels have navigated different parts in their careers, even at different eras, and it can help you form strategies that will help you today. Um, and, and, and dovetailing off that, find mentors. Um, find people who have done what you are trying to do, even if it's in a different genre. Find those people and reach out to them. People are very willing to talk to people and to form relationships and to offer their advice if they're asked. Um, don't ever be afraid to do that. It's free information. And I'm totally interested in helping people um, in general and in forming relationships with the people I'm working with as well as people in the industry in general. Um, you can find me, uh, you can reach out to me if you're looking for distribution or even just want to talk. My email address is nick at simdistro.com or you can follow me on Twitter at the Nick Gordon. Um, I want to thank you guys all for such a great panel. You've all dropped incredible bits of wisdom um, and I all uh, recommend everyone reach out to you guys and connect in general. Um, thank you again and uh, take good care and uh, stay safe everybody. Thanks, Nick. Awesome. Thank you. Peace, everybody.